Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the fifth episode of our Graph Gurus webinar series. Today, we're going to be talking about um, finding hubs of influence with PageRank in our native parallel graph database. So we'll get started by uh, introducing our speakers today. So I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Victor Lee, who is a director of product management here at TigerGraph. Hi, thank you, Emily. Um, so it's a pleasure to be with you here again today. And I'm going to be presenting today on the background of PageRank and how it works because that actually relates to what I studied at university. And we were going to be joined today by Abhishek Mehta, but our director of sales engineering, but he had a prior commitment. And so we are happy to have two great stand-ins today. Gaurav Deshpande, our vice president of marketing, who has a strong background in analytics, as well as one of our new but very capable engineers, Hui Ting Su. Um, and she is very experienced with developing applications and solutions for Tiger Graph. So I'm gonna get started into talking about the, the issue of trying to find influential entities in a network. And there, there are several reasons why you might want to do this. Think about what uh, used to be called viral marketing and is now sort of uh, been transformed slightly into influencer marketing. Uh, now that we have a lot of social media and people that are maybe well known to be influential. So if you can win over those key individuals and get them to communicate your message, um, then they will push out that message to many, many more people. And the, the multiplication factor can be a thousand or even a million. So that's one application for trying to figure out who is influential. Um, another reason is thinking about it from the opposite side. If you're trying to stop influence, how do, how do epidemics work? Epidemics work because they start in a few locations and because of the nature of the interactions, it spreads very quickly. Say you want to stop that. Say it's a disease or it's malware, it's crime, it's, it's information that you want to stop from being disseminated. The idea there is then to block or attack those influence hubs. And there's been research in that. So you could look at it both from, from either side. You want to um, take, make use of the influence or you actually want to inhibit the influence. But in either case, you have to find those entities in the first place. Again, here's some, some more example use cases. Let's say you're trying to find the most influential medical provider for a given region, for a given specialty. Again, if you can change the behavior of that provider, it will have a great impact. Maybe that provider is doing a great job at great cost, and you want people to emulate that behavior. Maybe that person, though they're influential, is actually not using the latest best practices or um, so you actually, if you can, maybe you are a drug provider and you want that person to adopt your new drug, but you want the market to adopt your new drug. So if you can change the behavior of this one person, that person's actions may be able to spread throughout the network. You know, one more example, um, which seller in an interrelated market has the most pricing power or some other power of affecting the market? or more broadly, understanding your network of players in some sort of game. Um, it might not be, it might be the game of commerce. It might be government regulation. It, it could be lots of things. It could be a supply chain. So you're kind of applying some of the principles of, of game theory as network theory to see how can I have the most influence. So we need a technique to identify those influencers. And now influence is not just the number of direct followers or connections you have. So just because you have many, many followers on Twitter does not necessarily mean you have a lot of influence. Um, because there's one, there's a downstream effect, there's the first connection, and then do they share it and do they share it? So how many, what is the multi-hop influence? Second group, what is the actual change in behavior that that causes? Um, something goes out, 
but does it make any change? So knowing both the, num the downstream, the multi-hop effect, and also the, the overall influence that that triggers is, is, is the problem. So it turns out that PageRank was actually designed to solve a similar problem. And you might not realize it, but um, if we look at the purpose, the real purpose of PageRank, you'll see that. So the original purpose was to find which are the most authoritative pages in the web. Um, if you're old enough like me, you remember when there was no web. And then when there just was in the early days, how, how would you find anything there? Um, so we had to have search engines. So you would put in some keywords, as you do now. We just take this for granted, but let's, let's break it down. You put in some keywords. It tells you many pages that correlate, match those page words, those keywords. But if, but if it's a long list of matches, which ones go at the top? And you know, the whole field of search engine optimization has, has gone around this. Um, making sure you get selected and making sure you're, you're placed near the top. So that's the ranking problem. Which ones do you put towards the top? So the, the people who developed PageRank, um, Sergey Brin and Larry Page, the founders of Google, and by the way, PageRank is called PageRank because of Larry Page, not because of WebPage. Um, they come up with two principles they try to satisfy. One, a page, page's authority increases if more pages point to it. So in the figure on the left, got more people pointing to B, so B has higher rank than A, all other things being equal. The second principle is a page is authoritative if the pages that point to it are authoritative. And you notice this is a recursive definition. Well, you are authoritative if I'm authoritative and I point to you. Well, how do you know if you're authoritative? So we'll get to that. How do we answer that recursive question? So this is just saying smaller icons, bigger icons, these are more authoritative, so D has higher authority. So how can we formulate these principles into some sort of something we can compute mathematically? So again, here's our statement. A node is authoritative if several authoritative nodes point to it. So let's look at this. Um, the page rank of V, which is the authority of V, should be the sum of its referrals. So the more referrals, the higher the page rank. That's, that's where this uh, several comes in. And the more, the, the higher. What is a referral? A referral by X, it's the authority of X divided by its out degree. That is the number of neighbors that it has. So if this is a node over here, this person is standing at a node and there are four out degrees, there are four neighbors, um, you take the current authority of X and divide it by four. And that score goes outward as a referral. So whatever authority you currently have, you kind of pass it on to your neighbors as a referral. You can, you can compute this overall. So that sort of looks at, at one point. And to think of it another way, think of your whole graph or network, and you have a random surfer. So we're doing a random walk. Start walking anywhere. Pick, pick any node. It doesn't matter. Now, and then every time you're at a node, randomly choose one of your available out neighbors. So there are four paths. So there's a one in four chance that you would take any one of those. And then, again, transfer this amount of, we're actually, we're not thinking about score right here. We're just thinking about where are you going and keep doing this walk for a really long time. The page rank is the fraction of time that you end up spending on a, on a particular node. Um, sorry about that. Or, or otherwise, it's the probability that if somebody were to just take a snapshot of where you are sometime in the long future, the probability that they would find you at a particular node. And so that's where the, the web surfing problem comes in. Where are people likely to end up? Based on the structure of the web, 
where are people likely to end up based on got a bunch of nodes and you got a bunch of hyperlinks, excuse me, pages and hyperlinks pointed out from those pages. If people just surf this way by following link to link, where are you likely to end up? And that is the idea behind PageRank. Now, does this actually fit what you want to do? Um, first of all, you need the appropriate network. It needs to be a network with directed edges going in a particular direction. So let's say there's a person standing on node V and there are three out neighbors of V and two in neighbors. And so these, the currently the page rank is described by of node V zero at time T zero. And so we initialize the computation by assigning every, every node gets a, a rank of one to start off with. You actually don't have to do it that way, but that's just a simple way of doing it. As I said, you can actually start with any initial condition you want. Oops, next. Um, again, think about traveling to the neighbors. So you take the current score of where you are, which at the first step, the score is one. And if it has three out neighbors, then we divide by three. So you send a score of point of one third, 0.333, to, to V1, V2, and V3. So that's why I said surfer at V0 gives to its neighbor V1. V0's score at, at that time divided by its out degree. Phase two of, of the still the same iteration. Now you accumulate everything that's coming into you. So what is V0 score gonna be in the next round? Its score is gonna be the sum of all the, the uh, passing on from all its, from its in neighbors. So V4, let's say V4 has two neighbors. It takes its current score and divides it by two because it has two out edges. And so V0 is receiving this rank of V4 divided by two. It's also receiving the rank of V5. And if we imagine that there's, this is the only connection, then we're dividing by one. So that means in the next round at time T1, the rank of V0 will be the sum of these two numbers. And that is basically the page rank computation. I've, I've skipped one detail for those of you that, that know this already, and I know some of you do know this. So the idea is you repeat that iteration of, of sending out your current score and, and then receiving it, and you repeat it. What will eventually happen is the scores will converge. They will settle down till they stop changing. And so when the scores stop changing, then you're done. And typically, depending on the graph, it may take 10, 20, 30 iterations. So here's, here's a very simple graph, three nodes, here are my edges. Notice I have one self edge here. What, what I have down here is called a transition matrix. Um, so you notice, and it's zero, V0, V1, V2, V0, V1, V2, um, the rows and columns. V0 has only one out edge. So V0 going out gives all of its weight 100% to V1. Similarly, V1 gives everything it has to V2. V1 to V2. V2 has three out edges to V1, to itself, and to V0. So each of the neighbors gets one third. So you can use the transition matrix and then you can think of the vector of current weights. So initially we have one, one, one. And basically you compute what is the score of V1 in the next, excuse me, of V0 in the next time step by multiplying this vector by that matrix. And you can fairly easily just sort of see this is what the scores will be next time. And you could repeat that. I haven't done it here, but we could do that as an exercise. And eventually the scores would settle down. Or would they? It's actually not guaranteed that they will settle down for every graph. And it's not, guaranteed that you'll get nice behavior if you have a couple situations. Um, if you have a node like, let's say this were the entire graph, that means these have no in neighbors and these have no out neighbors. 
what would happen is that all the score would kind of accumulate in, in V1, 2, and V3, and V4, and V5, and V0 would just empty out. They would end up with zero rank, and these people would have, you know, a third, a third, a third. That's not really what we want. So we added this thing called uh, teleportation or the damping factor. And we say, well, there's a high probability, say 85%, that you will follow the links as described before. But the rest of the probability, like 15%, is that you will teleport. You will magically hop from where you are to any other node in the graph with a uniform probability. So if there are 10, 10 nodes in your small graph, and if there's a 15% overall probability, then there's a 1.5% chance that you end up on any of the nodes, including staying where you are. So as I said, it's uniform random teleportation. The other probability is that you follow the links. And that solves two problems. It solves the mathematical problem of, of having these source or sync nodes. And it actually does a better job of modeling real behavior. If you're talking about web surfing, um, people don't just follow links. Sometimes they just go to where they want to go. Okay, so finally, we're, we're here to talk about G-SQL also. So on the Tiger Graph platform, the G-SQL language is actually really good at expressing graph algorithms like PageRank. So the top line definition defines the query, just like you're writing a procedure. We're going to have three input parameters. Um, max change has to do with deciding when the scores have settled down. Max iterations, how many iterations do you want it to allow? You don't want to let it run forever. And the damping factor is that 0.85. You don't have to use 0.85 if you don't want to. You can adjust it. You've got three parameters here. This is score is the current page rank of a node. Received score, that's during, while we're computing the intermediate calculation, how much score have you received from your in neighbors, which will be used to compete, compute the score for the next round. And max diff is, is sort of a, a technical factor used for deciding whether we have uh, stopped changing scores or not. We sort of say, well, initially, let's assume that we've, we're changing by a really high number and see if each time are we changing by less and less. So see we have, we initialize our iteration. We're gonna, every single vertex of type person. So this is a full graph computation. So that star means every person vertex is, is where we're gonna start out. We do a while loop while the change is still bigger than the maximum change. Um, max diff, but see, max diff equals, yeah. Um, that sign is correct. Um, actually ran this, so it should work. Um, and then this also says don't do more than that number of iterations. So this is the real body, the part in bold. And this is, this is a core concept in G-SQL. So if you understand how this works in G-SQL, you'll understand most queries. So we have a select statement, just like in SQL. S is the output. It's, it, it's, it's meaning that actually V is going to be equal to S. And S is this. Start, start was our full set of vertices. S is an alias. So in the remainder of this statement, rather than saying start, we say S. So starting from all vertices, travel across friend edges. Oops, that's a typo. Sorry, I didn't run this. Um, these should be, let me fix that right now. These should Um, we're going to travel across refer to edges and end up at some target vertices. So we have these three aliases, S, E, and T, to refer to the three parts of an edge. Source, the edge itself, and the target. 
Acume, this is the part that is unique to G-SQL. This is our, our built-in parallelism. This is like an implied for each loop. So it's saying for each edge that fit this definition, perform this operation. So for each target node, it has a local variable called receive score. Accumulate to that variable. S, remember S was the source and T was the target. So that's, that's where we are and that's where we're going. So where you're going, its destination receives S's score divided by its out degree, right? That's exactly what we talked about before. And this accumulation means that, remember, we're iterating through all the edges. So if we go back to our graph here, if we think V0, it has two in edges. It has from V4 and V5. So by processing this one statement, it's going to process all the edges, which in particular, when the target is V0, there are going to be two instances. There are going to be an instance when V4 is the source and another instance when V5 is the source. So we'll be adding to it twice. That's phase one. That actually satisfies what we did here. But remember, we made this adjustment for teleportation. So we do that as the secondary step. We do that full iteration, and then we do a second iteration called post-acume. Post-acume um, does not iterate over edges. It iterates over vertices. So now it says, for each of our starting vertices, make this adjustment to its score. Take the received score that we computed up here, multiply it by the damping factor, say it's 0.85. That's where you get the 85%. So there's an 85% chance it has that much. And then one minus damping, so 0.15. So the effect is 0.15 of fixed amount plus this variable amount. Why is this a fixed amount? Again, think about this teleportation. 15% chance of going anywhere. If the initial score is one, then there's a 15% chance of going anywhere, from anywhere, that ends up being 0.15. Now you might say the error is, well, but why are you starting with one as what you, with the weight you had before? We're just following what um, Bryn and Page did in their version of PageRank. You know, you could quibble about the mathematics of this, but this is what they actually did. There are actually variations of PageRank. There's not just one single version of PageRank. This is the version that they wrote. Um, and this is just resetting the receive score for next time. And this last computation is where we're checking how much did the score change for node S. That little tick there, apostrophe, is a little shortcut for saying the previous score. So we're comparing the difference between the current score and the previous score, the absolute value. And this max acume is automatically collecting a set of all these scores and picking out the largest one. So the, this is gonna end up, when you've finished all these loops, this will hold for each of the nodes, for each node in the graph, what was the largest change for that, for any one of those nodes. And that will tell you whether we should stop iterating or not. And that's it. So I got a couple more slides, and then we're going to go back to Gaurav and Huiting to show you a demo of this. Um, the couple more things I want to mention is that we now have a library of these algorithms. Um, they are written in regular G-SQL. This is one of them. Um, you know, I altered it a little bit for the example. That's why I had a typo in it. Um, but our library contains algorithms exactly like this. Unlike uh, some other graph database vendors where they have um, built-in functions that you can't see, you can see this function. So you can learn from it and you can modify it. And they still are gonna execute very fast because TigerGraph platform has built-in parallelism. So here is where you can find them. Um, they're on, the code is on GitHub. You just have to remember TigerGraph and Ecosys, and you can figure out the rest. And once you have the slides, you, you'll see the full URL. And we also have documentation on our documentation website, and there'll be a link to get there. 
We currently have eight algorithms. It's a, it's a small start, but we'll be adding one or two every month. So, you know, pretty soon we'll have 20 or more. Um, and what it contains are just really classic graph algorithms. Um, some are related to finding shortest paths. Some are related to finding centrality, which this page rank is considered one type of centrality. Some are for trying to figure out the communities within a graph, what are sort of the natural groupings. And similarity, which nodes are similar to other based on some sort of context, based on their attribute values and their connections, which ones are sort of reside in similar neighborhoods. So it's a recursive definition. And again, one of the great things about the Tiger Graph uh, G-SQL library is, is the scalability. Not all of these algorithms are fast. That has to do with the, the theory. It's, it's not the platform you're using, it's just the fundamental mathematics of the algorithm. Some of them take n cubed time. So if, if you have a million nodes, that's gonna be slow. Even it'll be faster on Tiger Graph, but it's still gonna be slow, to be honest. So not every algorithm is designed for giant graphs. Page rank, you can run on a pretty large graph because it's only like n, n squared time. It's actually the number of edges. Each iteration, you process each edge once. So it's the number of edges times the number of iterations. So anyway, you still want to pick a platform that has parallel processing, has memory efficiency, and has just good raw speed. And that, that describes Tiger Graph. And you know, just talking a little bit about the parallel processing, you remember I, I sort of described in the G-SQL language how, it, how you express things um, with the built-in parallelism. Because so each node kind of acts as a computational unit. And also you can see it so from the language side and then on the processing side. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Gaurav and Huiting and let them show you um, a use case where page rank not isn't ranking web pages, but is ranking something else. Fabulous. Thank you uh, for that excellent explanation, Victor. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now. And let's make sure that everybody can see it. Um, let's see. Um, Victor, can you see the schema in Graph yes. Studio now? Perfect. Right. Perfect. And let me just quick uh -huh. check. Let, yeah. let me just check the Q&A real quick to make sure that uh, anybody else doesn't have any other issues. Um, it appears it's okay. That's fine. Uh, let me just check. Oh, cannot see. Okay. Yeah. I will stop the share again. I'll, I'll reshare it. Uh, give us just a moment. Here we go one more time. Sorry, folks, we moved up to a bigger office. The advantage of a bigger office is that it, um, uh, it's nice and we have more room to expand. Uh, the disadvantage is our internet connection just got set up, so we might have a little bit of issues on that front. Um, now everybody should be able to see the, um, see the screen. I wanna make sure everybody can see the screen. Um, and, and it appears that everybody can, so that's perfect. I'm gonna go back to the presentation now. Um, so this is the schema. I'm gonna walk, walk through it step by step. So the first uh, schema that we are, item that we are looking at is the vertex specialty. Specialty would be things like cardiology, right? Which is an entire branch of medicine. And then within that, you have a subspecialty such as interventional cardiology, which basically is a fancy name for cardiac surgeon all electrophysiology, uh, the people that do uh, ECGs, for example, and all sorts of other ways of gauging your heart's condition um, using a combination of electricity um, and other, other equipment. So <clears throat> those are the type of subspecialties that we have. This is a healthcare data set. Uh, we wanted to show you a different data set this time because uh, we have shown you financial services, we have shown you telecom, we have shown you um, e-commerce, social media. So in order to have some fun with this, we're gonna show you healthcare and pharmaceutical data set today. 
Um, we got we got the next one that we are looking at vertex is a prescriber vertex. That's a term used in healthcare. Prescriber is essentially a doctor or a prescribing nurse. So this is something that was a new news to me. Um, my my father-in-law was visiting. Um, he was low on his medication uh, for blood pressure, and uh, you know we we wanted to go and get a new prescription, but the doctor that I usually see, my GP wasn't available. So I took him to see his uh, uh, prescribing nurse on his staff who can also write the blood pressure medication. So that's the reason why the term prescriber is used as opposed to a doctor, because both doctors as well as prescribing nurses can uh, write prescriptions. Um, then there is claim. Of course, all of us know what those are. Those are the ones that we file with our insurance company, whether it's Aetna, Cigna, United, what have you, or Blue Cross, Blue, Blue Shield, all of those are the claims. Um, and then right here in the middle is us, the patients. Um, hopefully you don't have to see a doctor anytime soon, just for preventive checkup. But you know, when you file those claims, that's, that's where uh, the patient files the claim and the patient, of course, um, goes and sees a prescriber as well. So that's the, uh, that's the data model. Um, that's the schema. There's a host of other things in this schema, such as what drugs or which particular pharmaceutical products the patient is taking, who's the manufacturer, what's the benefit plan, but we're not gonna go into that. This is a comprehensive healthcare data model, um, but uh, we're gonna go into just focus on the patients, on the prescribers and the claims, as well as the specialties and the subspecialties for today. Um, so with that in mind, let's go ahead and look at what queries we have. Uh, so in terms of queries, um, we have a query here called create a referral edge. Now, this particular query is meant for creating a relationship between one prescriber to another. Um, why is that needed? Now, typically, when the healthcare data comes in, uh, you have a bunch of patient claims, but you don't always have the information as to which doctor saw the patient first and who did the patient refer the patient to. So, for example, a particular doctor has seen the patient and uh, a cardiologist sees a patient and refers him to another cardiologist for getting an ECG, for example, or for doing advanced tests or for doing surgery. That type of relationship is not known ahead of time. So what we do in Create Referral Edge is we are creating that relationship to traverse the prescribers and understand um, which claims are submitted for a particular patient. Let's say a particular patient sees a particular prescriber uh, say prescriber um, one, and then that that patient sees another prescriber within three to four weeks, five weeks, uh, depending on the time horizon that you want to set up. Uh, let's say that says prescriber number 56. Um, those two prescribers, you can establish a referral edge relationship between those. So with that, I'm going to hand it off to my um, G-SQL guru, uh, Quitting, um, who has a master's uh, in operations research from Purdue University, and uh, she has, she's our resident G-SQL guru. So she's gonna walk you through this particular query itself briefly, and then we'll do the more fun part, which I know you're waiting for, is creating those referral edges, the relationship between the prescribers, and then running a page rank to find out who is the most popular prescriber. It's exciting because it's like finding out, you know, who are the lead doctors for a particular type of disease like cardiology. Um, for a particular specialty. So with that, let me have hand off to and introduce Huiting to the uh, Graph Guru audience here. Thanks, Gaurav. So I've briefly introduced how we create referral edge here. First, we have this subquery called create referral edge. And in this query, we first, uh, first uh, we have the, uh, the parameter is a prescriber. And from this prescriber, we want to find all the claims submitted by this prescriber. And from the claims, we traverse to the patients associated with this claim and collect all the claim dates to the patient. And in the third step from the patients, we want to see uh, which uh, other claims are associated with this patient. Remember that uh, you see that visited acum um, uh, clause that has been used to keep tab of which patients, which claims you have already visited. And we are using that flag to actually uh, traverse the graph 
to avoid repeating the nodes that you've already visited. So pay attention to that. Of course, we'll provide you with this query and the data set so you can play with it on your own. But I want to you want you to take special attention to the visited um, clause as we go along. That's the local, local um, accumulator that we're using um, to remember which particular um, uh, patients, which particular claims have already been visited. Yes, so here we check the data and difference to see whether there are some other claims that are made within two weeks. So if there is a other claim made within two weeks, we want to find uh, which prescriber submitted these claims. Remember I told you that the data doesn't say when a particular claim is filed. It just says it has one prescriber on it, one doctor on it. It doesn't say who is the referring physician. So we're using the logic here to understand that if a particular claim is filed and within two weeks another claim is filed, then it's very likely that prescriber one referred to prescriber 56, for example, as, um, as, a, as a follow on. Yes, yeah, so if this prescriber is different, is, is a different prescriber from our input, then we can insert a referral edge between these two prescribers. And that is to handle the condition that sometimes you'll go and see a doctor. And then again, you'll go to the same doctor. So obviously you don't want a referral edge between a self-referral edge for the doctor or prescriber one to prescriber one. And that's where that particular logic is filtering out that particular condition. Um, and I know we are going through it quickly because we want to get to the fun part, but you will have this entire um, uh, script available to you. And of course we have launched our developer portal on Tiger Graph. So come and ask questions. And you, you have um, G SQL experts like you being available to cover it with you. Okay, remember uh, here the input is only one given prescriber, but we want to know all the referral relation in this network. So we also have a main query to call the sub query to get all the referral edges. Let's take a moment on that. Remember query calling query is one of the important features Nest, or nested queries is an important feature of G-SQL that makes your life really, really easy because you can build modular queries like creating a referral edge and call those from a master query like create referral um, and, and execute on that. Um, go ahead, Yudi. Then you can run this query. Yeah, let's go ahead and run this query, uh, Yudi, and um, let the referral edges be created. Um, now, it's interesting point to see if the referral edges got created, and I'm kind of curious to see which prescribers are important now. Uh, so you can do it in a variety of different ways. Um, what I want to do, what I'm more interested in is after these edges are created, um, I'm more interested in finding a particular prescriber that has a particular specialty. Um, so after these edges are created, we have written a query here called most page rank score prescribers, pretty obvious name for the query here. Um, Qting is gonna take a moment to describe you what's inside the query. What we are trying to do here is if you consider a particular type of uh, specialty like cardiology, who are the top doctors who are operating, who are the most referred to doctors for that particular? Uh, I'm just gonna take a moment to see here if the chat has something that needs to be attended to. Okay, um, looks like we are okay on the chat. Uh, perfect. So let's go ahead and look at most page rank score prescribers query. QT will explain it. Again, the intention of this query is if you consider um, knee surgery, if you consider cardiac surgery, if you consider cardiology in general, who are the top doctors that are the most referred to doctors? Why is this important? It's important for pharmaceutical companies uh, such as that have a new health, health drug, uh, for example, for diabetes, or for uh, heart, or reducing cholesterol, or for managing people who already have heart conditions so that their heart stays functioning the right way, um, or they have new devices, medical devices for the heart. They need to know who are the top doctors for that particular specialty. Um, that's the, the pharmaceutical manufacturer, medical equipment manufacturers have immense use for this data. Healthcare providers like United want to find out for a given specialty who are the top doctors and then understand the referral networks around them so that they can target and reduce the cost of care without affecting the quality of care. So that's the business background. With that, let me hand it off to Yuting so that she'll cover the GSQL query now.
Okay, so this one is for when you already have the page rank result. And this one is quite straightforward. We just want to start from the a given specialty and to the, show all the subspecialty. From the subspecialty, we traverse to the prescriber and compare the page rank score. Then take the top K page rank score uh, prescribers. Then we can show all these prescribers limited by uh, the top K. Then uh, we, uh, this uh, edge set is just for visualization. So the result will be like a visualization result of the top K page rank prescribers. Perfect. So let's go ahead and run this. Um because referral ages are, are, are awesome, but of course running this query and finding out who the top cardiologists are would be more interesting, right? So let's see if we can find top three cardiologists maybe. Uh, and then specialty I want to start with is cardiology. I hope I spelled it right. And let's see if I can find the top cardiologist. So now you can see who are the top cardiologists. Uh, that's the output. And in order for you to see it clearly, I'm gonna expand that pane. Remember that you have that option right there in, um, in uh, Graph Studio. Uh, remember, all of this stuff is in Graph Studio. So there are three prescribers here, prescriber 56, prescriber 96, and prescriber 48. Now, you can have all kinds of fields in here, like their real names, their addresses, and so on and so forth, um, to understand who they are. The specialty is cardiology by itself, right? Uh, the, uh, subspecialty uh, is clinical uh, cardiac uh, electrophysiology. Um, then within cardiology, you have another subspecialty called cardiology itself, which is general cardiology. And the last but not the least, you have cardiovascular disease as another. Let's go ahead and add page rank in there um, to the prescribers and look at the page ranks now. So let's see if the page ranks have been computed. And excellent, the page ranks have been computed. Page rank for prescriber 56 is 2.59. Page rank for prescriber 96 is 2.13. So it looks like the, page, uh, uh, the prescriber 56 so far has the highest page rank. Let's go down and look at the third highest, which is prescriber 48, which has 1.76 as the page rank. So those are the top three uh, vertices that you have. Now, after you are done with this, um, you want to explore things like, you want to understand relationship between these guys. So what, what about if you have prescriber 56 at the top page rank 2.59 and prescriber 96 at the second most, which is 2.13, what is the relationship between these two prescribers? So you don't have to write a query for that in Graph Studio. You just go to explore graph on the left pane, right? And you go to find paths. Uh, and you can start to explore that, um, uh, the relationships here. So you can put the first prescriber as prescriber 96. Second prescriber as prescriber 56. And find paths between them. And there we go. Now you come upon an interesting finding is that there is a prescriber one in the middle who has been referring to both of them. <laughs> so that's the information. That's the beauty of having a, a graph engine that's real time, that's actually producing results for you. This is how you get new insights. So now I'm curious, what the, is the relationship between prescriber one and prescriber 56, who is the highest rated prescriber? So if I want to drill down further into that, I can do that next as a possible exploration. So what I can do is maybe replace the prescriber 96 with prescriber one, and then find paths between those guys and start to see how they are related. And I obviously need to hide. Now I, I don't want to see prescriber 96 anymore. So, you know, I can go up here and I can say only show selections. Voila. So you have, you can see a subgraph simply by clicking on this button. These are very useful buttons, guys. Remember this as you're navigating it. Show selections means you can select particular notes and only show those, and then you can hide everything else away. So it's kind of easy, easy, uh, easy way uh, to, to, to do this. Uh, now, 
uh, here, what you want to do uh, is, this is good, but now I want to start to see actually relationship between them. Just one shortest path is not enough. Maybe I want to see all shortest paths here. So let's go ahead and select the second option here and see all shortest paths. I still get the same thing. So maybe I need to see all the paths, but I know that the, both of these, this is a very popular prescriber. So maybe I can reduce my uh, path length to limit it to three and then start with that to see all the paths between these guys. So now when I do that, it's going to take a moment to compute and oh my God, that's a lot of connections, right? So I want, I want to figure out how to reduce that. So maybe what I can do is I can look at reducing those um, by choosing vertex types, specific vertex types. And it's taking a moment to compute because obviously this particular doctor is a rock star and has a lot of uh, relationship going on between these two doctors. So what I can do now is it's going through all the vertex types. You know, I want to see only the prescriber network. So, you know, I'm gonna select, unselect all and just select the prescriber network. That should help me reduce the amount of relationships. And maybe I can reduce the edges and only see the referral edge. So I'm gonna scroll down here and select just the referral edge here um, and, and, and select that and hope that that becomes less complicated for me to look at and consider uh, now. So it's gonna take a moment to refresh and paint it. And it's still <laughs> pretty complex, um, but what I can do now, uh, is start to reduce it further. So you think, uh, let's go down and um, uh, re re uh, reduce that further and uh, show a cleaner way of doing that. So now, as you, as you, as you, as you can see, when, when I hide away all the other complex relationships and just find the paths between those three. Now you have a much more sensible graph to look at. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to rearrange this so that I can stare at it and get more insights. So here I have prescriber 56, my popular um, and number one uh, prescriber here. Uh, I have prescriber one here, which is referring to prescriber 96, prescriber 97, prescriber 66. And of course, you can see here from prescriber 56 popularity, you can see it visually right here. You got this prescriber, you got prescriber one driving prescriptions uh, reference here. You got prescriber 48, you got prescriber 38, you have prescriber 50, you have prescriber 93, you have prescriber 27. And as you populate this data uh, with actual names, you can actually go to settings and see the real names of people also. I think here we have been lazy and we did not create those attributes for uh, names uh, or populate those names, but we will uh, populate those names and send you a data set with populated names. So what you could do simply here is go here, right? And then select the prescriber and select the name and that, that way it will become uh, very apparent to you. Um, now here, since I don't have names populated, it's showing blanks, but the data set that we'll send you will actually have names populated. So you can say, oh, prescriber 56, who is Dr. Thomas, prescriber one, who is, who is uh, uh, Dr. James, uh, prescriber 38, uh, who is uh, Dr. Sue, uh, prescriber 27, who is Dr. Uh, Kumar or Dr. Patel, um, all of these people are interconnected. So this is how you use uh, graph to explore, run page rank, um, use existing algorithm page rank. You don't have to rewrite it. Simply reuse that. Um, create the referral edges based on simple code that was, I think it was 43, 44 lines of code that created that inferred relationship between prescribers. Create referral edges. You can use that same concept for other types of referrals, such as social media referrals. Um, such as e-commerce reference, such as banking reference, um, uh, ride sharing companies like Uber, Lyft and others where people are referring each other into the network. You can use that and then create this entire referral network and visualize it. You can continue to explore it. Now I'm gonna do something fun here at the end to just show you the amount of uh, data that exists behind each of these nodes, right? So what we're gonna do is uh, take, gonna take our popular prescriber 56 and I'm gonna click on it and that literally is going to show you um, a host of network around it. Um, uh, and there you go. <laughs> Clearly, this guy is connected with a lot of prescriptions uh, to, a lot of, uh, to a lot of patients. And that's why it's showing you now. It is showing you 
claims file, it's showing you patients, it's showing you all of the other information. Of course, you can go back to our trusted uh, thing, only show selections, and that will cut down, uh, cut that down, uh, down to the uh, to the original mix. Or you can simply use the undo button here, uh, which will also do the same thing. And you can see that network is so strong; it's actually expanding through the entire edges, all the edges, all the relationships to all the other doctors and keeps on expanding. Now we can just do undo button so we can get back to the original uh, prescriber relationship. With that, we have only seven minutes left. I know I'm a little bit over my time in terms of demonstration, but I wanted to at least give you a taste of what this is capable of. Uh, let's open it up for questions, Emily, um, if you would, if you don't mind. Hey, Gareth, can you stop share and we will actually. Yeah, there's a, there's a benchmark that I wanted to just put up. There's a chart in there in the deck. Um, if you don't mind putting that up, Victor. Um, there's a benchmark for the half terabyte data set. Um, back to the PowerPoint. So I wanted to sh share the link for that with the audience. A um, lot of people had asked the question um, is how do you, um, how do you get the, um, uh, you have published a lot of benchmarks that are small and mid-sized data sets, you know, that's all beautiful, but uh, can you publish um, a, a large enough data set? And one of the users did it. Um, she published on October 1st on DZone a half terabyte benchmark comparing, comparing Neo4j and Tigergraph. Uh, I'll look, let you look at the results on your own. Um, uh, let's answer a few questions and then if a few people want to stay on for a couple of minutes after the questions, I can show you and walk you through the um, page rank comparison between Neo4j and Tigergraph. Any questions uh, that we have right now? Let's check those. Oh, let's we had one. Um, let me just read out a question that we had earlier and where I, I typed a response. So, um, and I think this related to the demo you were showing. So you were switching back and forth between the right query page and the explore graph page. And the question is, is there a way that we don't have to switch back and forth? Um, and the answer is yes. In the new Tiger Graph 2.2, which we will be releasing today. <laughs> I'm making a, re a release announcement. Um, users can, you can, there's a new feature on the Explore Graph page where there's a, there's a tab you can select to see the installed queries and run the installed queries from there. Um, that's going to be available in the Enterprise Edition. Give us a day or two to make that available for the Developer Edition also. Excellent. With that, thanking all those people who stayed a couple of minutes after the time. Um, you can uh, look at this webinar at your own leisure and ask us questions. Again, I'll remind you everybody that TigerGraph has a dev portal. Come to TigerGraph.com, visit our dev portal, uh, ask questions there. We are always there to help you write your G-SQL queries and as you, as you navigate other parts of the product. With that, November 14th is the next time when we'll meet. To, uh, to talk about community detection. Thanks a lot. Have a great day. Everyone.